know, the arrest of Mexico's teacher union leader is like a sudden, unexpected streak of, of lightning coming down in the darkness of Mexico. I mean, this education system is, is in bad shape on many, many levels. So I think for, for the children and parents and teachers of Mexico, this is a really sort of shocking uh, moment. I don't think that this kind of thing would happen in the U.S. I don't think that the union is nearly uh, as powerful or as obviously as corrupt as, as it is in, in Mexico. So it does put things in perspective, I suppose, uh, for people in the U.S. who are frustrated with our own teachers' unions. That uh, For many years, Mexico has been a, a case study in what happens if government totally rolls over and uh, allows the, the union to control literally everything <laughs> about schools. In addition to all of the other problems going on in Mexico, it was just a sort of long, slow motion tragedy. You know, one of the interesting things I found in traveling around the world uh, in the past few years visiting different countries is that every single place has a strong teachers union. And they might vary a little bit as far as what they can control. Certainly Mexico is an extreme case where the teachers control hiring decisions and can sort of, you know, allow teachers to bequeath their job to their heirs and, you know, just crazy things. Uh, that's, that doesn't normally happen. But in every country, the teachers union is a, is a powerful political force. So uh, this is sort of oddly reassuring. You hear the same complaints about it from place to place. But certainly, in some places, the relationship is less adversarial than it is in the U.S. and now Mexico. And in fact, there's no country that I know of that's dramatically improved its education system with an adversarial relationship with its union. So in other words, you need to have some baseline level of functioning and trust with your teachers before you can really do great things. You can do little things, but it's very hard to do that if you're fighting with each other. You know, Finland is sort of the holy grail, right, of education, and people point to it all the time. And it is true that when, when I was in Finland, there did seem to be much more trust on behalf of politicians towards teachers and teachers union leaders towards politicians, which isn't to say they didn't argue and disagree. I mean, they were at an impasse at the time over how to change the curriculum. So these things, you know, are never easy and simple. But there was clearly a level of partnership that you don't see in many, many, many countries, including the U.S. And that's partly because Finland over decades has elevated its teaching profession so that it truly, I mean, truly, teachers are the best educated people in Finland. So, you know, it's easier to have that kind of trust when it's very, very difficult to become a teacher. It's a very rigorous training process. And it's a true, a true profession. And, you know, people get paid better. All these sort of good things flow from that level of prestige and trust. Now, I mean, South Korea is an interesting counterpoint. I would say South Korea is, is not as adversarial as some of the union relationships in the U.S., but it's not like Finland. I mean, there's definitely tensions between the teachers' unions and the politicians and a lot of, you know, a lot of sort of uh, sometimes misunderstandings, sometimes actual conspiracy. <laughs> and and that, there's a lot of energy that gets that gets wasted that way. You know, in general, the U.S.'s system is very diffuse, right? And this is true of unions, this is true of our schools, and clearly there's huge inefficiencies there. That too is not unique though. So for example, Mexico had, you know, a whole bunch of different, has a whole bunch of different chapters essentially of its unions and they don't always agree. The union represents everyone from janitors to teachers to administrators. So it's a huge, huge tent that can be fractious. Um, so I think in a, in a lot of places, yes, there's inefficiency in having many different chapters in a union, uh, just like there are in having you know, 500 school districts in Oklahoma. Um, but <laughs> caging politicians can also use that to their advantage, right, by uh, playing on those divisions. And, and when you see big, big progress and big, big fights, that's often <laughs> what's happening in countries is that, you know, Finland managed to kind of 
partly by accident, uh, turn and turn a couple of its unions against each other uh, many decades ago. And in the fracas that followed, there was enough um, space for a lot of reform to happen. So Mexico actually is an interesting example. Mexico has seen the number of 15-year-olds actually enrolled in high school go up significantly in the past decade. So now they're at something like 66% of 15-year-olds are actually in high school. <laughs> so that's a, that's, you know, that's a big deal. The quality of what they're learning in school, though, which is the next logical question, is, is low, is, is pretty low. So you see that half of the teenagers in Mexico who are still in school um, are performing below kind of baseline proficiency in math for example, half, that's a lot. It's more like 15% in the US. So, you know, there's just, uh, there's not a lot of high quality learning happening on average. And you can see that Mexico ranks somewhere in the, you know, 30s, if not 40s, uh, compared to other countries around the world, right around the level of Thailand. So, you know, definitely Mexico is a place that needs to see significant gains if its economy is ever going to have the kind of human capital it needs to be a truly, you know, high-functioning system. Yeah.